Two ferry rides off the mainland of Door County brings you to Rock Island. The state park has interesting buildings and great views. Rock Island is part of a string of islands in Lake Michigan. Historically called the Potawatomi Islands, they stretch from the mainland of Door County, Wisconsin to Michigan's Upper Peninsula to the north. The nearly 1,000 acre island features over 10 miles of walking trails through old growth forests. You will be getting your steps in because vehicles and bicycles are not allowed on the island. You can bring your furry companion as leashed pets are welcome. The island has many rustic campsites for overnight stays. Swimming is allowed anywhere along the coast, except near the boat dock. Many come to see the historic buildings, including the site of Wisconsin's oldest lighthouse, the Potawatomi Lighthouse. Most will have to take two ferry rides to get to the island. The Washington Island Ferry Line is located at the tip of the Door Peninsula. This ferry is capable of transporting you and your vehicle across the passage to Wisconsin's second largest island, Washington Island. The trip takes about 30 minutes and provides some great views along the way. There is a 20 minute drive to the Rock Island State Park Ferry. This ferry departs near Jackson Harbor on the northeast part of Washington Island. Here, you will leave your car behind because the Carfee Ferry is for passengers only. As you approach the island, you will see an impressive boathouse. The fortress-like structure was built by Chester Thordeson in 1929. He was an immigrant from Iceland that made his fortune inventing electrical transformers. Thordeson bought 775 acres on the island in 1910 and began creating a vacation retreat. Influential figures like Thomas Edison and Henry Ford would meet him here. The limestone used to create this building was all sourced from the island. Most of the building materials came from this island except for the 50-ton tile roof. The Viking Hall Boathouse is anchored to bedrock seven feet below the water surface. Two 50-foot yachts were able to dock here. Today, cliff swallows nest in this area. The 40 by 70-foot building also rises 65 feet above the water. Named the Jewel House of Art and Nature, it is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The inside of the building is even more impressive. The tall arched windows match the shape of the openings below and may have been modeled after the Icelandic Parliament. The beams 35 feet above are Douglas fir. The white oak chandelier is 9 feet high and 6 feet wide. There are 20 buffalo horns, each adorned with four different colored crystals. Thordeson brought 29-year-old Haldor and Narsen over from Iceland to carve the custom furniture. The ornate oak pieces he created included tables, chairs, and a desk and chair set. Most have scenes from Norse mythology. The massive fireplace has great stonework. The runic characters etched into a steel strip above the hearth translate to Fire is one of the best things for the sons of men, and so is the sign of the sun if a man manages to keep health and live virtuously. There is plenty that can be learned within the building, which is fitting because it once housed Chester's large book collection. Today there are puzzles, chess, and checkerboards available to enjoy. There is also a model of a vacation complex that never came to fruition. The state purchased the land from his heirs in 1965 and now maintains the island. About a mile walk from the boathouse is a water tower with similar construction techniques. This tower was built in the southeast area of the island. 
The tower has arches and a fireplace as well. These builders also carved faces into the bluffs near the campgrounds. The path to the lighthouse is a 1.25 mile walk north from the boathouse. Along the way you will see the ranger's residence and office. Further down the path, the old garden gate can be seen. Originally, this gate was connected to a fence that kept the deer out of the garden. The gate is made out of three cedar trees. Nearby is a board to carve your name. The path continues towards the lighthouse. Watch out for uneven rocks and roots along the way. The lighthouse was built on the highest point of the island and is a welcome sight after the walk. The Potawatomi Lighthouse is named after one of the Native American tribes who had inhabited this island. The name means Keepers of the Fire. To preserve the lighthouse, you will be asked to remove your shoes after you enter the converted summer kitchen. Tours of the building are available from 10 till 4. The main kitchen has a stove and a china cabinet. It also has a sink with a pump that at one time brought water up from the cistern below. You're actually getting uh, a tour of two lighthouses for the wonderful price of free. <laughs> if you were milling around out there, you probably saw the rectangular dead grass design by the pump. Mm -hmm. That is the ruins of the first lighthouse. That was built in 1836. Wisconsin was barely a territory at that time. Uh, that building lasted about 20 years. The mortar mix was not as good as it could have been, and it quickly fell apart. And so in 1858, they built this one. Uh, this thing is just rock solid, in great shape, more than 160 years old, and uh, with any luck, it'll last another 160 years. The restoration was spearheaded by the Friends of Rock Island. The Friends Group is a nonprofit. We are volunteers, so we don't get paid to do this, but we are more than happy to do it. Uh, but the reason I bring it up is because donations still help us keep paint on the walls and, and uh, supplies here. Any merchandise sales, all of that goes to the Friends Group for uh, these kinds of purposes. When I first started coming up here, it was all boarded up, no lantern room. This building was in operation for about a hundred years, and then it sat vacant for a half a century. And I probably shouldn't say this out loud, but there was a, a grand tradition of people breaking in and having parties. Sure. <laughs> and I remember coming in with the ranger, uh, and this place was just a mess. Mm. And when the Friends Group President Tim Sweet said, you know, we're going to restore this, I was a doubting Thomas and I, I thought it was too much, but Tim Sweet did a great job of spearheading the effort to get it, getting it restored. We have a list of our keepers. I won't go through all of that. I'll just point out our first keeper, David Corbin. Um, he was a bachelor. A lighthouse inspector came out one time and said, you seem lonely. You go to the mainland for two weeks and I'll watch the place and you come back with a wife. <laughs> and uh, he took the leave, but he also came back without a wife. Mm. So that's, that's what it is. And Corbin is buried in the cemetery about 200 yards mm. that way. So My, right now is Ernie. Um, I think Ernie is gone, uh, but he was here long enough to see the restoration. And there's a video that we used to sell. I don't know if we still have it. No? Okay. But uh, after they got the lantern room on and the restoration was really happening, there's this great video footage of uh, some of the folks walking him down onto the lawn and, and he looks at the lighthouse and he says, yeah, this is just what it looked like when we lived here.
So that's pretty pretty cool. My other favorite guy is John Fitzgerald and if you look he started as an assistant keeper in 1902, got promoted to head keeper and was here until 1942. So he was here for 40 years which tells you something. None of the furniture in this house is original to this lighthouse. As I mentioned, the light got automated, and when that happened, no one needed to live here, and so they just emptied the place out. Mm -hmm. And so when the restoration happened, we needed furniture back in so that the docents could live here. Uh, we chose a period of about 1910 for our restoration, and when you're blessed with a 160-year-old lighthouse, you could pick a restoration period anywhere from about the Victorian era <laughs> until World War II. And we kind of picked a sort of middle date of 1910. So all the furniture, all the technology you see could at least have existed around 1910. The house itself, when you're walking around, notice that the floors don't squeak and the stairs don't creak. The first lighthouse fell apart because of the mortar and when they built this one they said we're going to do it right. And they dug right down to the bedrock which is not far. And if you know your geology you know that we are sitting on what's called the Niagara Escarpment which is literally like the bones of the earth. These are like billion year old rocks so it's really solid. And since it's built right on the bedrock, it hasn't shifted or settled. That's where you get the big cracks in the wall and all the plaster falling off. But it's, it's just rock solid. So we're very lucky. Come on in the front parlor. Over the years, different families would have arranged things differently. At one point, this would have been a kitchen. At other times, it could have been bedrooms. It could have been whatever was needed. Most of the keepers had families, but not all of them. Since it was a federal building, they would have had a portrait or a picture of the president. And the 1910 era that we chose, uh, William Howard Taft was our president. If you look out the windows, notice how deep the walls are. That's like two plus feet of solid stone for the whole thing which is another reason why it's in such good shape. Also, if you look at some of the glass, you'll see some of the panes are kind of wavy and cloudy. That's the older glass. It could even be original glass. And then some have been replaced because of damage. Um, also notice there's closets in almost every room. For this time period, that would have been really luxurious. Uh, but because it was a government building, they could afford to do this. So the keepers that lived here, they literally had the best house on either of these two islands at that time. So it was a good gig. They didn't get paid much, but you know, you had a nice house. So let's go into the front room here. We call this the Frank Sawyer room. Frank Sawyer was the first keeper in this building and he must have thought he was a, a, a pretty important guy because he took the liberty of carving his name in the stonework outside of this arch, which I'm sure he had no permission to do. Mm -hmm. And when you get a chance after the tour, take a look, you'll clearly see Frank Sawyer. And in the middle, you'll see something that kind of looks like a weird O. And I noticed it and I didn't really think about it. Well, some years back, some folks were taking the tour and some of these people were Freemasons mm -hmm. and they saw the, the little symbol and sure enough, they correctly surmised that it was the Freemasons Ark and Compass mm -hmm. symbol and they surmised that Frank Sawyer was probably a Freemason. So they looked in their secret books and sure enough, Frank Sawyer was a Freemason mm -hmm. and they were kind enough to give us a little bio and make this nice plaque and best of all now we have a photo of the first keeper for this lighthouse. Um, I'm less of a lighthouse buff than a history buff and when you get primary material like that that's just golden mm -hmm. so we're very happy to have that. So that's Frank. 
So this is our bedroom, and so this is the view we get when we wake up in the morning. Let's go in the front entry room. This lighthouse, uh, the, the design, the blueprint, is a, a standard uh, design. And uh, if you tour around this area, you'll see the exact same lighthouse. Uh, Pilot Island, same design. Um, Port Washington, the old lighthouse up on the hill, same design. And it's a good design. It's a very smart design because you can have two families, usually one keeper and their family got one floor and the other family would get the other floor. And generally the head keeper got the first floor, less running up and down, and the assistant keeper would get that floor. And the arrangement of the doors is such that you can come in this door go all the way up to the lantern room without waking these people up. Mm -hmm. So that's good too. This is a replica of a portable lighthouse library. Lighthouses by their very nature are in remote places. And so these families, these people were pretty uh, isolated. And a lot of times they had kids. And we don't know everything that would have been in there, but my hunch is there'd be uh, probably pleasure reading, maybe some reference stuff, but we know for a fact that there would have been school books for the kids. And uh, on one tour, there were some kids, and I, I made the comment, uh, we know for a fact that uh, children that grew up in lighthouses, many of them learned their three R's from books that they had here. And I asked one of the kids one time, I said, do you know what the three R's are? And the kid said, oh yeah, I know, I know. The three R's are reduce, reuse, <laughs> and recycle. It's true. <laughs> Not lying. <laughs> Come on up. And here I will let you just wander through the rooms and pick which bedroom you would choose. If you miss the last ferry, <laughs> uh, notice the tall ceilings. Notice the chamber pots. Um, I said none of the furniture is original. One exception is that stove right there is original to this lighthouse. When the first lighthouse fell apart, they abandoned the uh, Winslow array that they had and uh, they installed a fourth order Fresnel lens here, which was a huge boost, easier to maintain, could use lots of different fuel oils, uh, but when it was last in use, it was running on kerosene. And we have a little shack over there that the kerosene was stored in because they didn't want to keep a lot of flammable stuff here inside the building. So um, we have some replicas of fourth order lenses right here, little ones. <clears throat> and we have some of the equipment that they would use for hauling the oil up and down. Um, I often get asked how much oil did they use and how often did they have to go. And um, uh, from my, my learning that I'm doing, uh, a fourth order lens would have gone through about uh, a third to three quarters of a gallon through the course of a night. Plus they had to trim their wicks. Mm -hmm. So my best guess is they had to go up probably at least two or three times if everything was going well. And then if things were misbehaving, they might have to go up more frequently. You probably saw some photos in there that shows the restoration in progress. So when you're ready, we will go up. Um, and a little safety concern, these stairs get steeper and steeper until they are essentially ladders. Mm -hmm. And as you know, you go up a ladder facing the ladder and you come down the ladder facing the ladder. The nearest hospital is about 50 miles away. <laughs> so come on up. On your way up, you can see the keeper's office where records were kept. At the top of the tower, you can see the lens. It is surrounded by windows that provide great views of Lake Michigan and Rock Island. Today, the Coast Guard maintains an automated navigation light atop a nearby tower. 
you may want to check out two other spots on the north end of the island. There are stairs that lead to Lake Michigan. There is also a scenic overlook with views of the lake. If you don't want to spend the night on the island, get back to the dock by 4 o'clock. That's 4 o'clock central. Be aware your phone might switch time zones. Jackson Harbor Soup is a great spot to have a meal after you take the ferry back to the larger Washington Island. If you want to learn more about Door County in Wisconsin, check out this video.